behaviour, which was led by a somewhat confused government that had spent all of its time and energy on uh, on on Brexit, just didn't really know how to give people well, a clear position. Yeah, I think, you know, I think much like the States, Britain has had a couple of decades of... Uh, just slow slow things being slowly ingrained into culture you know uh, uh, things like you know if you know if you don't hang a flag from your bedroom window you must hate this country that's sort of an attitude of of you know don't listen to the science the science is just silly you know like listen to our leaders strong powerful leaders that's what we need is you know big masculine figures and and <coughs> So and I think that's how, you know, both the States and, and Britain have sort of ended up with Trump and Johnson, you know, and and, and they are two peas in a pod, you know. Um and I, think I think also there's this badges as well, isn't it, Tom? It's like you know, mm. everything gets given its hashtag or its code word. So mm. if you if you show empathy and sympathy and support a group that you may not necessarily be a core member of you're accused of virtue signaling you're like i didn't know virtue signaling didn't know it was two years ago no I, i've know, had to google uh, it a number of times because i keep having I, I you know i keep seeing it and i keep thinking am i understanding that right what i, I it's it, it's just a weird term that yeah. I, I hear thrown by one very specific group of people you know <laughs> who have no empathy so yeah so you can't empathize because that's virtue signaling yeah and you can't criticize the past because that's cancel culture you know you can't you can't you, i mean one thing i do source of culture agree. is is a is a new thing as well isn't it that's a new a new term being thrown about and, and i'm like can we stop calling it cancel culture can we just call it shutting pricks up like because that's really what it what it is. This guy's a racist fuck. Let's just not put him on TV every day. Hey, how about that? You know, it's yeah, not cancel yeah. culture. We're not we're not cancelling Piers Morgan. We're telling him he's a self righteous, stuck up, bigoted, racist <sighs> piece of shit who shouldn't be on British television front and center every fucking morning it's not difficult you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> and and if you want to bang on about freedom of speech and all of that not that britain has freedom of speech and i wish british people would understand that uh you know but but let's pretend we had freedom of speech then surely we as a british public majority have uh, a right to tell piers morgan to shut up and fuck off do you know what i mean like, absolutely right <clears throat> yeah and without it being described as cancel culture and i don't know how it can be culture because it, it's it's inherently not a cultural thing no if it is a cultural thing it's pointing to a moral compass within cult within yeah. that culture that says you're yeah. not close enough to the moral compass please yeah. fuck off and yeah. so i do think there's there's this sort of appropriation of what probably started as fairly decent badges then becomes a mainstream badge to, to tell yeah lots of people who might be progressive to stop being progressive so that everyone can stick and do what they used to do or hold the prejudice they used to hold. Mm. And, and the, the reality of culture is it's an ever-changing amoeba-like creature that just keeps rolling on and it changes yeah. direction and it hasn't necessarily got a central functional brain. Yeah. It just keeps cracking on. Yeah. And that's, you know, once you understand culture is not a thing, it's just now. And then that, and that now literally just went a minute ago and the next one's coming. That's culture. You've got to have cancel culture it's like it's literally an oxymoron yeah <laughs> it, it's interesting that uh i always find it odd that people get outraged about certain things without sort of taking a step back and going hang on this is just a, a knee-jerk reaction let's just let it pass because otherwise we're, we're basically having constant knee-jerk reactions oh the left did this so the right are angry so they're now doing this as retaliation and now now the left are doing this because that's their retaliation it's just this constant knee-jerk reaction um and but that, it, it you, just but there's society like, now right yeah isn't i mean isn't that society is that because you, yeah, you've just described facebook the media twitter <laughs> ish instagram yeah. but essentially shouting at each other is the new normal yeah yeah uh, dialogue yeah. and listening isn't because yeah. you know that's it. Everything, everything is set up. If you go and watch any news program, you have the opposite positions on yeah. the table at each other's throats. Yeah, and I don't, I don't yeah. think I've watched 
a, a sort of a program which discovers an end game through dialogue for a long, long time, where people turn up and a sort of something is posed at them, and then they talk together. And at the end, there's a, there's a new mutual understanding as a result of the people that attend. I haven't said I've seen lots of shouting. Hmm. So if there's anything, if we if we could get away from shout culture. That would be quite yeah. nice. I think I'd quite yeah. like to get away yeah. from shouty culture. Yeah, it's a, a, yeah. I, I don't get me wrong. I'll hold my hands up and say that you know, I I, I feel like I am sometimes part of the problem because uh, on social shouting. media, well, no, not the shouting bit, but uh, on social media, I quite often just if someone is being bigoted or whatever, I'll just delete them. I just I I. I, I I used to call them out on it and I used to try and have a conversation and then mm. realised I, I, it's so far beyond having a conversation. I just delete them now and I just can't be bothered. And, you know, um, I, I've had I've had a few people go, hey, you deleted me. Why was that? And I've gone, oh, because you were a racist and I, I don't have time for that in my life. And then they might argue with that and I'll just ignore that because I'm done. And I'll be like, no, no. I, I don't have time for this. That's why I deleted you. So I'm not having an argument with you now. Goodbye. The end. That's it. Um, Generally, in like the 70s, or 80s, and 90s, and possibly to a degree, the 2000s, when you may be, say, you and some friends or your family were at a restaurant and you had a spare chair, and someone would sidle up and go, Do you want, can I take this chair? And they'd take it over there. Every now and then, you'd feel slightly uncomfortable when someone would come over and go, Look, the restaurant's busy. Do you mind if I sit at your table? You'd go, mm. That's fine. Okay, you can sit at my table. Mm. Social media is a bit like that person coming to sit at your table, probably not necessarily even asking you, not mm. sitting quietly and enjoying the meal, but engaging fully in your discussion and then arguing with you and then wondering yeah. why it was a bit weird that you asked them to please go and sit at another table. It's like yeah. Yeah. What, you shouldn't feel guilty, although I'm, I, I'm not saying guilt is how they work, and that's how the correct word or emotion, but you are 100% with your right to block someone, delete someone, or remove someone from your social media group because it's not real. But, <laughs> and if, but yeah, we've seen actually, we've got to this so, place where there's anxiety around going, yeah. I don't agree with you, please go away. It's no difference what? removing it, it, a stranger from a table. This this leads me on to another subject. Oh, weirdly, I had no intentions of this podcast going in this political direction, but... Uh, I think that's what happens when you and I get together. I, so this is this this ties in with another topic that I have to word carefully because it's about a mutual friend who I will leave unnamed at this point, and Fantastic. she may be happy to be named. But you posted about her recently, having done a live stream. Yes. Okay. And right. there were. A barrage of misogynistic uh, yeah, 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 comments. Yeah, okay. So you yeah, know exactly yeah, who yeah. I'm talking about. I'm there. Well, this yeah. this person is scheduled to be, or was at least scheduled to be a guest on this podcast, and yeah. as far as I'm aware, still is. And I'm sure she's happy for that to become public knowledge and whatever in time, in due course. But I just think it's inappropriate to name names right now. Yep. Yep. Um. But I, interestingly, so so she was booked to, to be on, or not, we hadn't set a date, but had agreed to, to be on this podcast. And as with these podcasts, they just go with the flow and we talk rubbish about music, life stories, whatever goes. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the, it is what it is. Some people are weird enough to enjoy listening to it. And that's basically it. So there was as usual no agenda or anything with this person being on the podcast i hadn't you know sexism misogyny all of that stuff it hadn't even occurred to me that that would become a topic or whatever it just just wasn't on my radar and then you posted that post mm -hmm. pointing out the misogyny and whatever and i remember i had commented something along the lines of that's fucking depressing and then I saw uh, there was a comment thread from a few people that I know to be on our side. Um, and when I say our, I mean the general public, I hope, side. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then I'll say a woman came in saying 
uh basically there, there was a comment that suggested uh Oh, don't don't listen to the trolls. Don't don't feed the trolls. You know, don't worry about it. Sort of thing. We all yeah. we all have trolls, which I read and I went, yeah, fair enough. You know, just, I honestly I did not think anything of that comment. And then uh, I'll say a woman replied to that thread saying, that's fair enough and everything. However, you're kind of delegitimizing yeah. the issue at hand here. And then normalizing made, trollness yeah, yeah yeah that then made me go oh yeah oh oh yeah she's right and then someone replied to that saying something along the lines of you know well actually you know he, he this person was support supportive of you you know yes, and now you're yeah, being that a bit rude quite deep. that then yeah, yeah, that then yeah, made yeah. me go oh yeah i suppose they're right and then she replied again saying actually here's the deal and she basically said uh, something along the lines of um you know it's really only women that that deal with sexism and yes everybody does have trolls but we have those on top of sexist trolls and whatever which then made me go oh yeah and i sort of i agreed with every comment with in in time yeah. order going oh yeah i'm wrong oh yeah i'm wrong <laughs> oh oh shit i'm wrong and so anyway i read those those comments and i i walked away from it whatever i just I, I read the comments didn't really think too much of it and then i couldn't help for probably the following week every time i was washing up or having a shower or having time on my own this comment thread just kept coming up into my mind and it kept playing on my mind and i kept mm. thinking do i have that conversation with her do i do i make the podcast ab about that and then i thought I don't know what the right thing to do is because I felt like, first of all, I didn't know that that misogyny was really still out there. And and, and so that's why this ties in with our previous conversation, because I sort of said I, 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 I corner myself into my own little comfortable bubble and I'm very, yeah, very yeah. comfortable with that. Thank you very much. And yeah. anybody who doesn't fit into my bubble gets quickly exited. Um, yeah. So I just don't see these things happening. It, it just does. It's not on my radar. And and having, you know, grown up in a, a, a house of women and me, uh, because it was just mum and sisters, I, I I never really experienced anything from a male perspective. Mm. So so these things had always just kind of been off my radar. And then, and I always felt like the best thing to do was to. I always feel like things like sexism need to be corrected at source. And, and and by that, I mean things like primary schools, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just teaching basic equality from an equality <laughs> perspective. And I think, you know, th these aren't things that, you know, I think the vast majority of, well, I'll say men, actually, because I think it's a, a, a male issue, uh, or the issue is kept within males. Um, but I feel like, I, I think if you've basically, if you're a sexist twat at age 30, you're unlikely to ever not be an idiot. I, I just feel like that's kind of how it is. So because of that, my way of thinking was that when I first read that comment thread, I thought, well, I'll just leave it as it is because actually I want the focus to be on her being a good producer and good DJ because mm. that's what the podcast should be and that's what it's about and that's why she's a guest. Yeah, I, She wasn't picked as a guest because she was a woman and she certainly Indeed. wasn't picked as a guest because she had some views on or a different perspective that needed discussing out or arguing with god forbid or whatever do you know what i mean and and so then i but and then i said but after reading that comment thread i then thought am i wrong to be ignoring it am i part of the problem by ignoring it and so i was i was left in this battle in my own head of should i approach it am i wrong to not approach it and then if I do approach it, am I now just distracting from the fact that she's a good producer DJ, which was the whole fucking thing in the first place? So I've actually privately messaged her since then and, and explained that and said, look, it's up to you. If you think it's a good thing for us to approach that subject and thrash it out, great. My view 
up until this very moment is that it probably shouldn't be approached because the viewers of a podcast in my view will be stuck in their ways and i don't know if we're ever going to be able to change the view of a podcast listener um not not that i would seek to do that anyway but i don't know if it would be either so it just becomes a divisive issue because basically you're preaching to the choir and i think the vast majority if not all people who follow me on social media tend to sort of think along the same lines anyway yeah. so so i, I kind of i just got stuck in that conundrum of well what what is the right thing to do what am i supposed to do i don't know do you know what i think I mean? you, you did the first thing right which was to ask her what what course she'd like to navigate yeah and i think the second thing is is that you know whoever you are however deftly you handle the world around you and how much finesse you've got with your with your intellect and absorption of information we all have confirmation bias we all have our prejudices Absolutely. conscious and yeah. subconscious and i i will seek to reinforce my worldview with anything i can get my hands on which Absolutely. will maintain my somewhat lefty liberal you know veggie stance on the world and and yeah. and, and, and and that will be it and of course the 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 reality is that you shouldn't make sweeping generalizations like those that watch a podcast won't change their view. And I think the reason why I would say it'd be a great thing to talk about in or explore some of the podcast is that unlike social media where it's binary and extreme and not real time and it's all verbal, there's no nonverbal, in, mm -hmm. in a dialogue where you can't rehearse it and edit it, the exchange of views between yourself and her would be a hundred times more valuable than a written discourse because a question will be asked, a response will be given, your True. question will follow True. the response and it will follow yeah. its own course based on familiarity and how, how what is, you know, all of the, the, the non-verbal signals will be read in a very, yeah. very different way by an audience. And, and then yeah. the, the sincerity of the position or the emotion of the position comes across and it's not yeah. well-written, yeah. semi-point scorey comment after semi, you know, and they yeah. weren't point scorey. I mean, obviously no, I no, no, but thread, it, it does easily become one-upmanship, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 But it asks, enables you to ask the question like how does it feel what was your experience what do you wish would change why do, you know mm. all that stuff gets explored and it becomes incredibly personal and human and i think that's what there's not enough of you know when i look yeah. at how conferences are laid out you know one of the things that i spoke to ben turner about um very very briefly um, at the last physical ims was how, in my view, I felt the conference format was getting a bit tired. I, I'd weirdly, I left IMS in, Mal in Malta, which is my favourite one, actually, because it's like 60, right. 60, gagging to learn, effectively, kids in a room yeah. for production, DJ, or whatever capacity they're in. And only really about sort of six panels, and usually there's only like one or two people on stage. So it's mm. literally an interview on stage for an hour to a room of people going, feed me knowledge. And then yeah, yeah. You, know, you go to you go um, to a party and you fly home a couple of days later. So it's great. There's a lot of the big machine conferences like AD in Miami, and to, to a greater extent IMS now, where, you know, the panels are filling up with larger numbers of people because yeah. the politics has got involved and the brands are coming in because you need the extra money because so many people yeah. comps and it's being distorted yeah. from an experience where you can sit in a room and hear reality from someone's experience or from someone's intellect or from someone's knowledge. And, and I, I said to Ben, I said, wouldn't it be amazing? Uh, I may have actually been to Danny Will. I said it, not, not Ben, but I would say to Ben, if you're listening, Ben, I'll say it to you. <laughs> Which is that IMS can crack on as it does, but you need this kind of deep IMS next to it where maybe you pay a premium where there are three interviews a day where your phone is left in a box when you go in, where you're yeah. scanned for pens and paper because there's no yeah. way you can possibly write anything down or record yeah. anything. And yeah. you sit somebody down with or without a bottle of Yerbas or vodka and you go deep interview. I love it. And let someone just go in, kind of like this, but just go, you know, illuminate, yeah. get James yeah. Barton interviewed, get, yeah. so, get whoever it needs to be, just let go. Yeah, and let them and let them go in the knowledge that Twitter's off and the cameras are off and the phones are off and that the the audience is watching yeah. and listening and, and that's it. And I think having that 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 knowledge that it wasn't recorded and therefore wasn't going to be broadcast or 
passed on anywhere uh could potentially allow some guest speakers to really open up about the truth on on some yeah. issues and there are lots of issues in this industry let's well not, you can imagine not some of the about, issues but. you can imagine some of the issues that i would have been thinking through at that time seeing as mm. this thread pulled on from um from misogyny you know there's been some I was quite horrific say, things happen in the industry of late yeah, and, and allowing absolutely. some people to talk freely about those um yeah. without the fear of, I'm sure fear is the right word, but without the repercussions of the share and the retweet and the post. Well, yeah, I mean, there have been some issues, I, I think, that is under both yours and my radar that, uh, you know, in the last couple of years alone, you know, that have been serious legal issues with serious legal consequences that's happening in the industry. And, and you know, those sorts of things, if they could be, spoken about open and frankly i'd pay serious money to go and watch that exactly. yeah what a great no, idea I, I love I, it we should I, do it let's do it let's yeah. start start it. it let's i'll put the business plan together now. go deep <laughs> go deep go deep yeah, I love and, and i spoke to um i had the pleasure but also you'll understand when i say misfortune but misfortune to talk to an incredibly talented singer songwriter who happens to be female this week Mm. who's had some absolutely horrific experiences in her career professionally and personally over the last couple of decades of money's not being paid contracts not been honored credits yeah. being removed or lo lots and lots of different experiences yeah that have ultimately led to her not making writing or participating in the creative process for around six years so being robbed of the things right. she was born to do yeah and we had we had a wonderful call um and <laughs> It was a very emotional call and there were lots of there were lots of tears in the call and some of them were mine because it was just so awful as a participant in the music industry who and you know in my case i sit next to the commercial process and the creative process and you know and i i am not a creator i am not a writer i'm not a producer that's not the thing i was born to do but i completely understand under the skin of the creative process not that i could ever do it of, of what's that's challenging where you get your fuel from what it means yeah. to have it taken away what it means to have the block and um, suddenly understanding that someone had spent their life towards a point and much of what had stopped that fruition was misogyny and some of the darkness that is in the industry is just mm. soul destroying mm. you know it, it's inhumane i think yeah. Yeah. and um you know it I guess it's the kind of it's experiences like that that heighten my need to speak. And then every time I look back at something I might have written three months later, I kind of go, God, you were so ignorant or naive and clumsy. Maybe you shouldn't have said, maybe you should have said something else. So like, a, it, but I guess that points to constantly learning, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, and not being, not stubbornly holding a position and saying, this is it. You know, this is, this is the truth and it shall always be. Because, you know, a lot of the, the deep issues in each society in the industry, because we're only, our industry certainly is only reflecting a wider society with all of its cracks and fractions and fissures and breaks. I, yeah, yeah, I think it is, to be honest. I hate to say that, but I, I think it really is, yeah. Um, yeah. So we just, we're just a good Petri dish, really, or, or microscope is probably a better analogy for, for it. But I, you know, I've, we, I've got two daughters. I, I cannot possibly... Um, stand idly by mm. and allow or, or not use what little tiny smidgen of influence i might have even if i change 10 people's voting habits or five people's beliefs or two people's understanding of what misogyny is or one bloke's approach view to when he goes to a nightclub next time and sees something wrong happening every mm. one of those those actions taken or, or thoughts influences change so you can either sit on your hands and be the silent one or you can step up and say something and do something and i think we've got to get to that point and this this last week of like i said yesterday i think on facebook this last week after international women's day and everything else that's happened um has been a very painful week and and for me personally in a household surrounded by women and so many three women and me uh is has made me feel incredible i haven't felt 
under pressure or guilty or, or guilty by proxy, but I felt very um, exhausted by what must be just a normal day of womanhood in a century when we yeah, should have put that absolutely. to bed by now. Yeah, because I, and I think but it, it's it's all sort of come about at the same time, I think, for, for well, for all of us, I guess. But because there's the, the whole... Um, I I have to admit I've I've not been following the news as much recently because because of lockdown I sort of I've I've learnt my dates of right April twelfth shops are open <laughs> anything else is just irrelevant <laughs> but uh, so I understand there's been a killing in London uh, and a girl was killed on her way home from a pub club bar something. By his house, in fact, even worse, even worse. Oh, was it? Two and, right. half, two and a half mile walk from, home, yeah. from friend to home. Yeah. Um, which yes. I, in fact, I actually looked up last night because I was wondering where in London it was, and it was it was Clapham Common to Brixton was the walk, right. which I thought, yeah. for yeah. fuck's sake, that's actually a walk I've done myself hundreds of times, having played in both Clapham and Brixton a lot, you know, um, and. I don't think it ever once occurred to me that it could be risky, dangerous, anything, and you know. Well, not, um, you but wouldn't expect a, it to be a policeman that carried it out either. So, well, no, um, exactly. Yeah, so it's it's doubly worse. Um, but yeah, all of these things seem to have, have sort of thrown up questions, and and of course that then brings out the misogynists who start saying, "Oh, well, it's not all men," and you then go you, you know much like the all lives matter crew and all of that uh, which is just baffling where you just think well if you're more offended of potentially <laughs> being called a misogynist than than then the misogyny. by the actual misogyny then you're part you, of the you need to have a look at that um <laughs> it's, it's, it's true thing. and that that's the quote i think that resonates with me at the most so it, I mean, it, is, it has been fascinating and i've got lots of friends lots of colleagues who have different perspectives and that's mm. great because different perspectives mean you can all go on a journey you know you and i don't have the, the monopoly on correctness or rightness and so no. as i say i will look back at i could look back at this chat in nine months time or nine years time yes. you know the people yeah. will no, be watching so, it now and, going and mate, I what expect are you talking to, about actually so, interesting you say that because i actually expect to look back at this conversation sometime in the future and go oh that was weird or whatever Clumsy. you know that that was yeah. yeah that was uh cringy because because honestly i i you know me approaching this person in question was me holding my hands up going i feel like i've been wrong all this time and and actually by closing myself in my bubble of friends and whatever I'm now not in a position to call people out, which maybe I should be doing. And I always had this view that, like I say, by the time these discussions get to a podcast level, they're really just superficial. And that's what I mean mm -hmm. by by um, n perhaps not being able to change the view of the viewers of the podcast. And I and I don't mean that in a derogatory way in any way for any group. Just the prejudice is in. The bias I just is mean in. that. But yeah, by that, by the point, the by the set. time someone's watching a podcast, it's a superficial conversation, whether it be a good one or not, you know. But it, so I, I feel like that's the kind of the the predicament I'm in, where I feel like, you know, I had always, I don't know, I, I there's a part of me that always felt like, well, it shouldn't be a straight white man shouting from rooftops <laughs> because because that's the last person they need shouting on their behalf you know but actually maybe it should be a straight white man because no, yeah, he's exactly. the only bloody person that gets heard so 100 percent right and i'm i'm with the latter which is if it that, that silence is it enables those who seek mm. to have the you know the derogatory behavior and language and position um so better to speak out supportively and clumsily than to stay silent mm. yeah it's an odd one um but i understand why you may feel the space is best used by those who who, who are most um um done to yeah or yeah. who are losing most but i think actually you know everyone needs to use their 
their voice and their moment in the sun, really, I think. Yeah. And um, yeah. as long as it's authentic, because that's, that's the thing, you know, you can see, you can see those acting without, I think you can see those acting without integrity and who are merrily jumping on the bandwagon and those who yeah. kind of know, yeah. you know, who have thought it through and have experience or need to say something and be supportive. And, well, and you can see those who are just simply provocative. Yeah, that that almost becomes a, a grey area at times as well. I noticed with the the Black Lives Matter movement of last year, um, there were brands picking up on it. And again, I was sort of torn with some of those because some of them you could see, you know what, this this brand is showing some sincerity and some support and whatever. And then there were other brands where you're thinking... Uh, you know, uh, uh, there wasn't a BLM you're, burger. You're, was you're, there? I mean, you imagine Burger you're, King announces BLM burger, and you're kind of like, hey, I was just going to say, like, you're you're one step away from saying, you know, quote BLM ten for a ten percent discount. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> but that, I mean, that's literally. I mean, you, you define one of the things that's most sort of frustrating about the world is the appropriation of culture and cause and mm. change into n- norm. And when it becomes normed, it becomes wallpaper. And and I think that's where that appropriation of BLM now is kind of, and the, I appreciate this is sort of too pale male and not too stale individuals talking about it, but we're, because we're talking about something that just isn't in, in, in us as an issue. Mm. It's, it's in us as an issue that we need to support and be vocal on, but it's not ours. And it's always, you know, and so we can, we can be honest about that, but I'm, you know, you watch the schism that be the Black Lives Matter has created now within the black community in America, where there are some who are distancing it, going dropping to the knee makes no sense because it's achieved nothing. Now it's just it's just it's yeah. been appropriated by white businessmen, yeah. businessmen, <laughs> so that they can put a, you know a commercial wrap around the knee. You know, it's yeah. like it's achieved nothing. I'm still getting the same crap I got last year. What's the point of the knee? Um, Crystal Palace footballer um, and Wilfred Zaha just did the same thing said I'm not dropping to the knee because it doesn't achieve anything mm. like if it meant something I would do it like again yeah. I, I'm barely qualified to even bring this into the conversation but I think that's that's so on one hand you've kind of got a responsibility to bring change to the mainstream but of course the minute you do it, it stops being the thing that you intended. And yeah. that's it's very much like electronic music and rave music from the late 80s or mid 80s through to the mid 90s. Like it meant something then. It was designed to make a statement either about disruption or politics or homosexuality in those days or drug taking or just breaking whatever rules it was. And then the money machine got hold of it and it became something completely different and yeah, it was number yeah. one and it was palatable and no one ever danced to it again. It was, that's what happens unfortunately with, um, movements. <laughs> yeah. It does seem that way, uh, which is, it's almost ironic in a, in a sad way though. Um, but yeah, you were, uh, almost changing the subject completely but i'm going to try and thread it in here uh, you were born in brighton were you not i was actually born in leicester um, oh, okay. i was born in i was born in leicester i wasn't there very long i was born in leicester in the saint francis of assisi convent and i was okay. i was uh, blessed at birth for being remarkably fat and <laughs> um, or rather sorry remarkably heavy but by by proxy pretty chunky yeah. and um uh, but I was only there for about 18 months. Then we moved briefly to Wales uh, in Pembroke, then across to Brighton. So by the time I was six, I was in Brighton. Right. Okay. And um, so, yeah, broadly, that was 34 years of Brighton. So it, it, that's where all my influence came from. You consider yourself a Brightonian? So, yes, I did, I, yes, yeah, Brightonian. Um, yeah, I do, yeah, I mean, although ironically, I guess five years over here now, I feel less bright. I feel, you know, when I do go back, um, it, every time you go back, it feels like a, it's a little less like home because the world moves on. So, you're, yeah, yeah. I, my, I think spiritually, I'm like the blue and the green of the Balearics now, you know, the pine trees and the blue skies and the blue yeah. sea and the white, the, and the, the white tea. That's, that's, that's home. But yeah, all of my influence was very much Brighton and Zap Club and we're all, you know, um, Big Beat Boutique and 
you know, all of that was very much my misspent youth or well spent youth. Yeah, and I, I I'm guessing that that kind of probably put you in a good position to to be as politically minded as you are and certainly as left leaning as you are would it not but then i suppose i, was, I, I, wasn't, I don't know there I was a lot of conflict no. around brighton wasn't there i suppose you've got uh, but the extremes weird. of both end of you well look if i you have now perhaps the london by the sea very much um impacts that kind of clash but no i actually funny yeah. enough i you know, i was late to the party politically and right. i didn't really awaken that for a long time i mean look i went college and university i just passed me by in a blur of right. dance platforms and then i sort of mistakenly fell into banking for 10 years and then wondered how on earth that had happened put myself in the midst of the of, of capitalism running i've been mean, running 33 abbey national branches in london you know you couldn't be more in the system <laughs> if you wanted and then i kind of it's like, what am i doing you know and, and just i left and joined prs so to how did you leap. how did you go from from banking to prs what i uh, i i I woke up one morning and I was like, I can't, I can't do this because banking, the banking system doesn't care about its staff. It doesn't care about its customers and it doesn't care about its future. It cares about that number right now. Mm -hmm. And you either, and if you don't make that number right now, then you get three more chances and you won't be here anymore. It's right. brutal. And I've never really come across as kind of a, or at least at that time anyway, it was pretty horrific. And there was lots of, at that point as well, you had lots of different, there was a hell of a lot of pressure and lots of, issues around the banking system and uh when so is this is this early noughties this is it is yeah it's about 2003 2004 okay. i think yeah yeah so then i kind of i opened the sunday times and, and this, i'm like i've got to get out and music was the thing you know i spent my whole childhood pretending to be in pop bands and writing out tours and designing albums yeah. and making taping the radio and all this stuff it was everywhere was music you know, I was listening to Ghost in the Machine in 1981 on vinyl. I think, well, I must have been seven, you know, so I was younger than that. So you kind of, um, so you then, I get the times and I'm like, okay. And in, there's a very antiquated advert in the corner with like a 1950 style logo of MCPS PRS and it's in like Times Font New Roma or you know, Times New Roma. <laughs> Every, every word made like PRS today. Oh, it was perfect. It was perfect, and every every word made sense. But the sentences were like, I don't know what that means. But it says music. It says audio product senior manager. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can uh, see, what, I can, what you, you know, just said. Go. All the words make sense, but the sentences don't. That is publishing for every musician <laughs> alive today. You've just described publishing, basically that's that's what it is I, I i see the words i know those words not I in that don't context get them in that order and i don't know what the goal of that sentence is yeah <laughs> indeed if it is a sentence if it's not just yeah. like a stream of yeah professional I, consciousness are you asking a question <laughs> yeah so then i um i applied for the job audio product senior manager it's a big big mm. step down from where i was but i was like i just need to start right. again and uh, I was into about 100 people apply for the job, 99 lawyers and me. And Sharon Dean, who was the, my interviewing, um, my soon-to-be boss, thankfully, previously she'd worked at Visa before, so she came across. And she's right. like, I don't want another lawyer. I want, I want to rip it up a little bit and bring in someone with a bit of external experience. So I'm forever thankful for, for Sharon, because if it wasn't Sharon, I wouldn't have done my time at PRS, and I wouldn't be doing what I do now. Literally, the, the one person in the world I need to thank for that is Sharon Dean. Right. And um, so she hired me, and on day one, it was like the lion's den because in front of me is this team of sort of 30 odd people, all of whom have eaten alive the membership handbook and know all the licensing schemes and know all the under yeah. code words and the acronyms AP1 this and APT that and MP this. And, and I'm like, oh <laughs> shit. So that was that, and that's how I got into it. And then I just kind of just pushed warp speed at, at MCPS PRS and tried to do as many different things as I could there from licensing to membership to operations to strategy and uh, board level work. And I finished my time there four years as membership director. And then that was it. It was time to press on. And 
um, pressed on in two directions, one in publishing and one running the Association for Electronic Music, which which coexisted until they couldn't coexist anymore because the publishing was, it was a massive conflict of time and I couldn't yeah, do as, both. Uh, what's, what's going on with the Association for Electronic now? It, it, is that's still running isn't it uh, yeah, you, I mean, you just it, handed over the reins to someone didn't you yeah so when uh when i was at prs in, in membership at a, we set up a whole new structure in membership with kind of account management roles and mm. um and greg marshall was one of the the account the sort of senior account management team looking after publishers and he always been was a dance music producer and fan and dj so when about two years into my time at AFM, I needed more resource. Greg was who I brought in. Um, and I guess I, and probably Ben Turner knew that my time there wouldn't be forever. You know, I was really a starter. I wasn't a finisher in the sense of AFM. I was there to sort of break the doors down, raise our area, shape up all the things we were going to do, but then it needed a, a, a very much a deliverer and, yeah. and a, a critical thinker, which is, and Greg is both of those. And so what's been fantastic is that Greg has um, operationalized the association and normalized what it does into like, this is what we do, not just yeah. not just headlines and grandstands and interviews and hashtags, but yeah. just made it a, a real trade body. Because it's a huge job. It's, it's a global trade body for every sector of the industry. And it only set itself up in 2014 and it's funded yeah. entirely by fees. Yeah. So you've got to constantly be getting everyone to renew, constantly be driving change and constantly be managing your costs according to both of those and for the whole world. Yeah. And, and you're a not for profit. So it, it's quite, it's very stressful. It's full of strain. And so I can only applaud Greg for getting hold of it. The madness that I kind of passed on to him and kind of putting it into, into a structure that makes sense. So it's doing a lot of great, it's done a lot of great work globally around COVID. It's done some incredible work around sexual harassment and um, and diversity a lot of great work around commercializing monetizing rights for electronic music and you know it's a wonderful organization and it's taken a hell of a lot of people's time and effort to get it there but it's um it's, yeah, it's something I'm, I'm proud of that's for sure i'm pr- pretty proudest of the work that it did on drugs policy in the us and and wider afield but it's um right. yeah, it was good it it, it, it <laughs> It was like a, the university of dance music in some ways. You kind of you go going in and working with an AFM, you see everything. You know, you don't get the live lens and the live lens only. You get recorded live and rights and tech and everything that's bubbling up anywhere about anything just kind of passes yeah. through the desk of AFM. So it's, um, yeah, it's a great experience. Yeah. And, and, and I'm guessing that all of this led to building the perfect skill set really for, for Black Rock Publishing. Yeah, I mean, but, but well, yeah, yeah, yes and no. I mean, the 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 the, the real acceleration of it was when Chris, who runs Centric, who we'd used as our admin partner from 2013 to 2017, came out here to New Yorker and said, "Mark, but we want to we want to change it up a bit. Why don't we buy you and bring you into Centric, create an electronic music division, sit you on top of it and just create all of the right services for all of the right people and businesses and go. And and that was the moment, that was the trigger when all of that running it by yourself, blood, sweat and tears turned into sort of becoming a, 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 a part of a dynamic growing company. I mean, it, mm. it, the, the growth in Centric's business without a loss of its culture and a loss of what made it special is is you know we've really ridden with that and so now the, the centric electronic music division has centric electronics that's your online publishing tool go on set it go 12 month with creative full exclusive songwriting agreement with advance you know there's, there's a plethora of, of products that fit and all the services that fit electronic music and i guess it, so the answer to your question is yes having seen all of those things from banking to prs to mm. afem they like the, the jigsaw puzzle got kind of mostly complete and now yeah. it, we're just con- now i'm able to kind of plug all of those things together and understand customer service and understand the need to kind of have products for sectors but then understand from prs the role of the creator and how you know i always felt incredibly proud and privileged to be serving um 
songwriters at PRS. In fact, it's often to my cost because I found myself representing the voice of the 100,000 members into PRS rather than the voice of PRS out. So instead of being the mouthpiece out, I was the mouthpiece in and kept on probably getting myself into trouble for saying, yeah, but (laughs) like all these people probably don't want that or all these people probably do want this and the thing you're all talking about isn't what they want. And (laughs) that was was my fault. I'm a bit too too keen to be the champion for the many rather than the the kind of the capitalist for the few right back from the top. So it's all come come to its fruition, I think, at the right time in the right place. Yeah, and I think that, that, that comes full circle anyway, doesn't it? When you start speaking for the majority um you know you've got the majority on board Uh, yeah exactly i I, I like to think that somewhere in life that pays dividends Uh, yeah like it's extremely difficult in those performing right organizations as well i mean for for those that don't know them you know they're in every country is a performing right organization that collects that manages the rights of songwriters and publishers and collects the royalties for them and pays them to publishers and writers. And they all, they're all slightly different, but they all, they're all they all sort of slightly self-appointed and all slightly remote and all slightly bureaucratic and all slightly opaque mm. to different degrees. And they're all slightly run by the major publishers and major writers before it gets anywhere else. And they're, they're all got yeah. a sniff of democracy, but not quite. And so they're very, very hard political animals to work in because they're, the, the, the lead, they're insulated to a degree from commercial forces and they're insulated from creativity because it's not down to them to make anything sell. You know, they're yeah. just recipients yeah. of money. They're all like backs, really, but with with yeah. with something sexier around them because it's the music <laughs> industry. But you you know, but you 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 have to kind of navigate this weird path where a licensing team thinks they're the best because they're getting all the deals done. And then the ops team have to pay it out, but they can't make that. The system don't fit the deals that are being done. I mean, it's completely insane. You spend your whole time just basically in a state of conflict with everybody. Yeah. And ex CEOs like, were saying, "No, that was your fault, Mike. You were always in conflict. We were all fine." But you know, they're they're hugely conflicting business, trying to reconcile what writers want and publishers want, and what the board want yeah. and what the staff want and what the leadership want and getting all of that on like if there's a ceo out there at a pro that's navigating that well i give them a round of applause because it's a very tough yeah. job and it's easy to do it very badly very quickly and i know some that have yeah rather rather them than me to be honest so i yeah. don't think it's a job i could do yeah. yeah um so yeah so i guess that brings us up to the present i mean um I, I, yeah i mean take an opportunity to sell black rock to us because uh I think oh, that that's uh, not not that that was an agenda in this podcast, and not that I'm well, making this a, a commercial venture. But you, I think you you've you've just given yourself a great setup to it there. <laughs> well, look, I think the main thing about Black Rock and Centric Electronic and, and the music div- the, you know, the electronic division of Centric is it's we've built it so that everybody can access it. And I guess mm. as I looked at music publishing from afar and successively closer and closer i saw that one there was there was a increasing gaps emerging for electronic music publishers um they were out there but they fell into different categories they were mm-hmm. they were what i call collection publishers which is good with data get your money pay it to you they were um creative publishers which was like, tell me about the collections thing it's fine but let's make loads of new music let me get you some introductions mm. and then there wasn't really the sort of space in the middle for some for a sort of systems driven scaled up business that could have equally good systems equally good people and equally good creative mm. and sync and so uh really what we've been working on since 2017 is exactly that is building a business where if you're a brand new producer with your you know, your first master demo ready to go, you can jog on to Centric on like Centric Electronic online, register who you are in seconds, register your first song in seconds, and it will mm. ferret its way off into two hundred territories around the world, be registered and ready to collect. You know, and the sync team will have a quick listen and work out if it's for them, and you can register your gigs and you can re- register, you can apply for syncs all, all the way through to. Roger Sanchez full catalogue, you know, proper big full service deal, um, and we've got everything in there. So, um, so we've ended up in, I guess, where we wanted to, which is the sort of the, the fully socialist 
centric electronic everyone's the same everyone's equal you can access and use it as much as you like through to the very concierge black rock fully wrapped around the individual yeah. you know bespoke negotiations uh, and a, a group of very good people within that team who are passionate about electronic music dedicated to making sure that each day we're better than the day before and that's all we can mm. you know we can really do is is and i guess this the, the the reflection of that upshift in performance is if i go back two years ago we would i would do my thursday evening or thursday night friday morning release radar playlist on spotify you know who's released this week what yeah. do i need to listen to yeah. and that might take me that might have two hours of music in and now it has eight hours of music in yeah because that's how many more people we work with and I would be happy on a Monday morning if we'd had 10 Radio 1 plays on from Friday to, to Sunday. Last weekend, we had 61. So the the, the change in that performance, and, that, and that's as blended between Black Rock concierge publishing as it is centric electronic you know, socialist ideal. Everyone has equal access. So yeah, we're now equally yeah. balanced between all of the propositions that we offer for publishing, be it yeah. you own it, you do it online, or... You know, we we kind of um, account manage it and client manage it closely. So I'm proud of yeah. that. I'm proud of the fact that it, whichever way you come in, yeah. we found we found a, a design for you. Yeah, and I think that's kind of critical to to any publishing these days because I, you know, I mean, I come from you know the the generation where uh, I, I I couldn't tell you how many different publishers I've been with who who literally you know they go yeah yeah we'll take on your publishing and they'll sit back and put their feet on the table and just wait for the phone to ring you know and and it's uh on the flip side i think it's very difficult for new producers these days i mean i think it's a complicated issue anyway publishing i you know let's be honest I, i've been in this industry longer than I, I care to confess to but but at the same time, I wouldn't say I'm in any way, shape or form uh, even close to what I'd consider knowledgeable about publishing, you know. Um, well, why, should, why should you be? That's like saying, you know, it's not like saying that's a basic way to say it, but you wouldn't expect me to be able to sit in your studio and make music by the end of today. Sure. You know, I might know the, how to use a computer and I might understand the name of the software yeah. and I might understand the scales and I might know the instruments. But putting all of that together and making a track, that's but, incredibly complicated and takes time. So you might know the headlines of rights and royalties, but actually being a publisher is, is, is the same as anything. It's a lot of learning. You've got to yes, do the knowledge. But, got to do the knowledge, mate. But <laughs> I would also say that for, for any new producers who listen to this podcast, you know... You can make money from gigs that is aside from your gig fee if you are a producer yeah. as well. If you write your own music, and I, I couldn't even tell you how many producers I speak to on a regular basis who go and play gigs around the place, and they yeah. didn't even know they could actually just register the the performances um, and actually make more money from that. You know, um, it's it's shocking how many people. Are just unaware of the basic things when it comes to publishing and and performance royalties and and that side of things and and things like neighboring rights and, and yeah, all yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff i think um, yeah i think there were two two dimensions to publishing to understand and i guess one is how how long it can earn for and the role it plays in your income stream and I guess, secondly, the things that you can do to claim it. So, like, for instance, we, we have a client in Scotland who is, from a sales perspective, is a sort of top 30 on track source, not a top 10 on Beatport, if that gives you the sense of relativity. Yeah. Makes a lot of his own music and has two residencies, one Friday, one Saturday night, every week. And, and because of the style of music he produces, he tends to fill his sets with quite a lot of his own music because it's what he does and yeah. so every month those eight sets are registered and every quarter when we pay out we pay out every three months around 40 percent of his income comes from from his gigs because yeah, he's there we go filling in the box as it were yeah and yeah. 
that's in the hundreds you know it's a piece of kit every three months it's not it's yeah, not yeah. beer money it's studio money right he invests yeah, in yeah. his career which meant that then over time the sales and streaming revenue went up because the songs and recordings were better yeah, or better yeah. made so so it was an, so publishing enabled him to invest in his career to make the re his recorded career bigger than his songwriting career in terms of revenue and then the other thing is how is the longevity it's almost like your pension fund money because mm -hmm. And I must do it at some point. There, there, there should be like a line graph showing the immediacy of money from music. So on day one of release, your sales and streams shoot up. Right? And probably pre-release, you're right. If you just assume mid-range gets played on radio one, yeah. pre-release, you're probably getting your radio play happening. And a year later, you get your publishing money. I'm being crude. Yeah. It's not precise. Please don't shout me down. Yeah, any yeah. other publisher <laughs> listening? That's not entirely like I'm just. I'm just trying to illustrate. He doesn't it, know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's nine months. What does he mean? <laughs> yeah. So let's just say it's radio play. Twelve months later, radio pays. Then on release day, sales and streams ping up. Oh, there goes the activity through the roof because it's release day, and then it tapers off over the the next week or month or three months or whichever period, depending on success. And then that money, if you publish by us, comes back to you between nine and 12 months later. And if you're in the kind of, in the traditional way of collecting, which is less direct and through PROs and sub publishers, it could be 18 months to three years later, but it's, it's, mm. it's there, it's in the future. Yeah. And all of that, that um, echoing money, a bit like Starlight, what you see is something from a million years ago. What you yeah, earn in yeah. publishing is, is not from last week or last month, it's from last yeah. year, yeah. which is really beneficial during periods of change like we've had and depressed opportunities to earn like 2020 because it's been a survival revenue which is why there was such a race to publishing in 2020 because those that hadn't booked in their survival revenue needed it you know and so it's either yeah. plays a role in making you a better artist like i described yeah. in the first scenario or it's it genuinely has played a role in the last 12 to 18 months in paying tax bills and mortgages and rent and food and e yeah. either way it's been valuable yeah which has been the case here yeah, yeah. I, i'm yeah. you know i would say where where my income stream was probably let's say you know anywhere between 25 and 50 percent of my income was from the publishing side of stuff during the pandemic um it's it's had a spike as well which has been nice and an unexpected spike and has become sort of 75 to 80 percent of my income you know um so yeah so it's 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 an interesting topic because uh obviously as you know i'm, I'm now running 5302 recordings and and the uh one of the artists from there is sort of going oh, i don't know if i need to sign up to prs and i think prs is now it's a few hundred is it 400 something like that i could be wrong but it's now it, it, it probably is for fee, mcps i think, I think right? yeah i think it's 100 for um uh for prs and right 400 for mcps i mean i wouldn't it, okay. it's more cost effective if you're an individual to sign up yeah. for prs and a publishing deal yeah. Or if you're right at the beginning of your career, publishing deal makes some money, join PRS. There's different views on how to do that. But joining MCPS, yeah. I'd really see that as a preserve of of a publisher for now, just because of the, the cost. Yeah. And and yeah. remember that the, the the kind of the question we always get asked is, well, why should I get a publishing deal? Why can't I just put my join PRS and put the songs on there? And you know, there's some really important differences, and they are really important differences. They're not sales pitch differences. You know, number one, PROs don't share data with each other. They don't mm. push it to each other. So if you register in one, it doesn't go to the other one like that accurately. No. Yeah. It'll get pulled from society to society, depending on what they've been told has been played or performed. Yeah. So the drop-off as you go, like, circles out from PRS is like, you know, by the time you get to France, 10% of the music has been lost out of the system. By the time you're down yeah. to Spain, it's another 5%. By the time you reach yeah. Japan, only half the tracks are registered. So you, you, you immediately have yeah. that issue. So just from data, publisher's job is to make it accurate everywhere all the time. And then you move into creative. You know, the, no one at, at a PRO is pitching a music for use in TV, film, or adverts. And no one is really putting you together to work on top lines, remixes, or co-production. So yes, you can be a producer that joins PRS or be a songwriter that joins PRS and money will be collected for you, but it won't be the global revenue you're due yeah. and it yeah. won't be added to 
they won't be made 150 percent even if you even if you get to the 100 percent you're due which won't happen you won't get to the 150 percent you could have because they, it'll be up to you to work on creative and up to you to work yourself into sync and that's yeah, yeah. best way for me to put it really yeah yeah and that's and i think as a as a new musician that's an incredibly difficult thing to navigate to find you know much like when i was starting out in my career and trying to find a a booking agent that was more than just somebody who answered the telephone um you know they were like rocking horse shit trying to find um you know it it was just this eternal nightmare of yeah yeah i'll deal with your bookings and you know there was say a few bookings i was getting myself anyway but it wasn't i wasn't flooded with bookings and they'd basically just be taking a cut of the bookings i was getting myself and it just made no sense and you know yeah. th there seems to be quite a few uh, publishers out there at the minute who seem to operate along those lines i'm not saying that they're doing it on purpose it just sometimes feels that that's the way and and i think especially with publishing because as you say you know it can take years for for royalties to come through yeah um i mean i i had some royalties come through uh the back end of last year that were for uh, uh an appearance on a tv channel in america some <clears throat> one, of the, one of the god channels and uh i think it was 2016 was the the air date um you know it had just taken the best part of four years to get to me basically but it yeah, got yeah. there eventually yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it can be quite frustrating trying to find a publisher because I think, you know, when you're signing up to a publisher, y you, you, you should and you should want to sign up for a very long time in one way because, mm -hmm. because actually you need, you need that time to even work out, you know, whether they're any good or not, um, which makes yeah, it very uh, difficult <laughs> as a musician. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's weirdly that that statement is why it, we kind of launched the way we did with shorts and contracts. It meant that every month we had to prove ourselves, and every month we had to demonstrate the activity we carried out whilst that revenue was coming through the various systems because you would have people going, well, so, you know, I joined you last week. Where's my money? It's like, it's, it does take longer. Um, and also don't, you know, there's signing up for a long time and they're not realizing you've, you've signed up for life of copyright and you can never get out and you yeah, can do a whole yeah. podcast on, on contracts. So I think that the challenge of, publishing is one getting a, getting the industry to a level of understanding of publishing so yeah. that you people can appraise what is a good publisher and a good publishing yeah. deal without yeah. needing to take a degree in the topic and there is no central resource that sort of says put in the things there's no like money supermarket.com for publishers you know publishing supermarket.com what do you want what are you, what are you what are you looking for i'm looking for this yeah, yeah. oh the one you want to go for is here click here and sign up and that you know it's just it's so far from that and and if i'm just giving anyone a business idea you can take that from me i don't need to kick back yeah, as long as we just come top of the ranking it's fine <laughs> so um but it that you know it, it we must be getting to the stage where not that you can commoditize it that's a horrible phrase but where there are standard functions of publishers that you must be able to say these are the ones that do this these are the ones that do this yeah. these are the ones that do that and then find and find your way accordingly and then that will drive you know people to rise to those standards because you know it's, it is a one of your questions earlier or observations earlier that there are those that collect and are perceived to only be collecting a percentage of what you could have got anyway i don't think any publishers are collecting that it should always be adding value even just by the collections process because they should be yeah. collecting revenue you wouldn't have got if you had done it yourself yeah but the bit the, the you know the bits that move into sync and move into creative that's you know that's resource that's people that's where you put people cost into your business and so therefore you have to have brilliant systems doing brilliant things Otherwise, you can't have brilliant people because you will end up mm. doing eighty twenty deals the wrong way. You know, you'll get the twenty yeah. and I'll get yeah. the eighty because the cost is so high, and that's the that's the tension. And th yeah, and I think that's where the majority of people want to have a publisher, isn't it? They want to have a publisher that has a uh, an entire team dedicated to you as an artist, and they're making phone calls to Hollywood, you know, music supervisors. And... Oh, I got the guy for you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and exactly. it's an odd one because. Because actually, even with that, you know, I I have 
lots of deals that I've done over the years where I've synced music to certain videos or whatever and, and the deal has been done direct whether it be an editor that I just happen to know through friends of friends who phoned me up and gone I need something that sounds like this have you got anything and I've gone yeah actually here's one and you know so there's been a lot of those and and then there are other things where uh funnily enough i i was talking in a previous podcast so I'll, I'll skim over it for now just for anyone who's watched that one as well but uh i uh recently got an email from someone saying hey big fan of your work uh i heard a, a track of yours called x y and z uh on a, a cycling video like a uh that i subscribe to um, is there any chance I can get a copy of it? I can't find it anywhere in the shops, whatever. And I read the name and I thought, I recognise that name. I remember that name, but I don't remember ever finishing a track or publishing a track or whatever. So uh, I then look into it and I and he, in fairness, linked me to a promo video for this company on YouTube and whatever. And, and, and I sort of sat there going, I can't work out how the, this company got this track. The only thing I can think of was that I must have uploaded it to SoundCloud and someone yeah. must have just scraped it. it from SoundCloud and 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 I, and I thought and I thought to myself I just kept stewing over it thinking I know I've got a really bad memory. Like my 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 calendar runs my life. If it's not in my calendar, it didn't exist basically. Um and so I'm, I'm sort of looking in my hard drive. I've got, I don't even have the MP3 of this track. It's not in my finished tracks. It's not in my published tracks. It's not, it's not even in my archive tracks that maybe I'll use one day for some other crap. Um, so I'm sort of just thinking I must have just uploaded like a draft version on SoundCloud. It wouldn't have even been the whole thing. And he was basically making the statement along the lines of it's only two minutes long or something. You know, can I get the whole thing? So I'm thinking that there's no other answer. Basically, I came to the conclusion. It turned out to be the wrong conclusion, but it, um, and and this has a happy ending. Don't worry. But but yeah, I basically then accused this company of of thievery, thinking I I, I can't work out how you got this track. You must have scraped it from my soundcloud. It turns out that basically a a, a colleague of a colleague of a colleague had managed to somehow get me to send a couple of draft ideas of some bits and pieces and they'd just licensed those drafts they, they actually turned out to be i think it was four or five of them uh and they just licensed them out to this company and made some money and uh yeah and, and there was no contract my end or anything like that and luckily Amazing. the 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 it turned out <laughs> within 24 hours the ceo of that company had got in touch with me and was apologizing and i was like well it turns out it's not your fault you know so um yeah all's well that ends well and we managed to get a licensing deal and stuff like that but it's it's one of those things that i always find difficult trying to explain to new producers and new musicians how you go about getting these deals and and you know i have the the the, there are lots of these deals that i have in my life that i've negotiated myself and i've managed to go through the contracts and go yeah actually i'll agree it for this that and the other and whatever but i think that's kind of the burning question for new producers and new musicians is how do you get those deals and and for me I always sort of hold my hands up and go, well, probably 80% of them are by accident, you know, <laughs> where where someone else has done the, the, you know, in this case, for example, is is probably the perfect example where really someone else has done the hard work for me. And yeah, OK, they've tried ripping me off, but I, I've managed to claw it all back and get the deal done in the end, you know. Um, but it's, I think this is where publishing becomes vitally important where you've got someone looking after that and looking after the the rights of that music and um you know i think a, a lot of people kind of maybe assume a publisher to just be the person who just sits on the end of the phone and whatever <laughs> whereas yeah. actually you know there are all these little complicated things and i think you know uh, i guess the question is is if you were a new music producer, musician, composer, whatever today, you know, what's your best entry into the uh, the industry to the point of 
making an income because I could tell producers and musicians, you know, how to write some cool music and, you know, maybe do all right on Beatport. But even today, a top 10 on Beatport is not probably going to make you much more than minimum wage for a month. Yeah. I guess probably total, you know. So, uh, and while we all know that, yeah, if you get a top 10 on Beatport, then you might get chased up by a couple of local promoters or whatever but even that's getting less and less now so do you feel i guess this is a whole layered question here but do you feel like the music industry are are we reaching a point where only the rich can become musicians Wait, I, mean, so I guess we've come, back to pay, we've come back to patrons and troubadours, have we? Where only patronage pays. So we, yeah, so, if, so basically, we've come to the end of the recorded music industry, as was with all the fat checks and the fat cats. And we've come back to the heady days pre Mozart, where you got commissioned for your music for a fortune. <laughs> Otherwise, you had to troop from town to town, plying your wares for bread and milk. Yeah. Well, and then we you come tell back me, to, well, maybe, maybe, well probably. We no, I don't think we have. I think what we've done is we've we've kind of there's been a lot of disruption. And mm. buzzwords like disaggregation, where all of those different steps in the chain of getting your music out between making it to selling it, you know, there's there's a lot less people involved in it now, but there's a lot less revenue now. So to get scale of the industry, like any industry, the costs have to come down, and then the cost mm. comes down, the the, the price can because it was competing with others you know, it, it, at its highest level. Every industry is competing and every company is competing for a wallet share. So the music industry was competing with the games industry. And for a good while, though, the games industry was a lot better than the music industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if you just look at them as competing industries, travel, games, fashion, social media. So there's time that you're competing for. And music takes a lot of time. Instagram mm-hmm. takes 30 seconds. You know, music takes, depending on your perspective, according to Spotify, two and a half minutes, according to you and I, 12 minute long grandstanding <laughs> marathon mix with a giant in you know, a breakdown and a huge year. But anyway, but you see what I mean? It's like, if you just lift up 20,000 feet, you've got industries competing. And for yeah. a while there, music wasn't competing very well. And, and it's, it, uh, but it was still in demand, hence piracy. So people were like, look, I still want music, but I ain't paying that for it. Because yeah, the market yeah. always wins, right? So the market yeah. said, I'm not paying 16 quid for a CD. I want that one track and I'm going to get it for nothing because I can go over to Russian.com and go and get it for nothing. So I'll do that. Yeah. So, um, and at, at the same time as that was happening, it, it was getting easier and easier to be a producer and easier and easier to make music and easier and easier to create a label. So we've gone from it just in electronic music from... 20 releases a week to 20,000 releases a week in the space of 20 years. Mm. But that's, and, and, and only a very small number at the top making money. And then everybody's setting up labels and, and everybody's a manager and everybody's an agent. Like everybody's everything all of a sudden. Everybody's a pop star. And, and so that's what we've got. We've got this mass commercialization, um, mass uh, consumption of music, all within all you can eat buffets like Spotify, which you know, the, if the price is the same, but more music is consumed, and obviously the price of each or the, the payment for each gets lower. So that's so you end up in a place with all of those things combined that says owning an audience is the only guaranteed way to succeed. And yeah. so, very, very clever artists and producers understand that getting a thousand people to pay a hundred pounds each a year gives you a career. And now you just got to work out how to get to them, how to keep them and what to give them. So they keep spending their hundred pounds, or it could be 10,000 people paying 10 or a hundred thousand people paying one or a million paying 10 P it doesn't matter. As long as you work out your economics and work out by yourself or with your manager, your route to them and route to monetize them. Yeah. It's the same as opening um, an organic food shop in the corner on the high street market and money. You know, who's your market and how do you get the money off them for the product that you want to sell them? And and if and I'm sure at the very beginning of the food chain, literally in 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 the organic farm shop, is an incredibly passionate producer making the most amazing carrots and the most amazing limes and the most amazing lemon and harvesting the best possible whatevers, mm. putting immense effort into their craft. But yeah. every step from that onwards is is monetization is marketing is yeah. pricing is is packaging and it's the same rules and and however depressing that might be to someone who's you know in zen like creative mode that's it is spotify disruptive 
is it valuing rights properly? Probably not. But I can tell you exactly where the first problem was. It was when PRS decided to monetize, so to license Spotify rather than continue to license the labels that gave the music to Spotify. And it, and it got, yeah. and the price point was wrong. It's actually YouTube, sorry, not Spotify. Um, but it, and so, you know, we are where we are. We need to, to lobby for change, of course. But as, as many artists in the new world post democratization and disaggregation and post streaming are making bundles of money through controlling an audience yeah. because they're just growing their following through every social media platform they can and then getting that audience to stick to them for things that yeah. create monetization moments yeah. whatever that moment might be or that merchandise might be or that gig or whatever it's just to flip the model around to go okay i'm not releasing the music to grow my audience to make my career so i'm not selling music to get gigs yeah <laughs> i'm so i'm making gigs to sell music you know whichever way around it is like yeah. It, yeah. It, everyone's and that's it and the only true way to ensure your career is to grow an audience that consumes your product yeah unless your audience is corporate yes and then you open up a whole new world and and, and uh, maybe that opens a new question for me actually because uh i don't well, they'll I, pay a lump sum remember so that's different so if you're doing it properly in a corporate world you might you know it could be a one-off fee that makes your dreams come true it depends on, well, on what it is well yeah because i so when i said corporate i was actually thinking uh, you know, I, I know DJs who've done parties for Microsoft, for example. Mm, okay. and yeah, 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 sure. Had huge fees, but but actually, now I think about it, even things like sinks. You know, if you can strike a deal with, well, maybe not Netflix because I can't imagine they're the best payers in the world. But uh, mm. if you there isn't, there isn't would, really a Netflix that pays because it's all a different production studio. So yeah, and, that's what I mean, I, and. <laughs> I, I honestly I've so I've uh, I've had one piece of my music I think appear on one Netflix show once that I don't recall it I saw it on my statement but I don't remember there being a figure so it, it couldn't have been anything significant but um, I, I guess the question is is if you were a musician and you just wanted to make music from that because this is the thing that I think also a lot of music producers don't discuss enough is the fact that not all of us are born performers. Not all of us mm. want to be on stage. You know, for me personally, I'm incredibly lucky that I, I love being on stage. I, I don't consider myself a born performer, but I certainly lap that moment up. Um, but I've got friends who are fantastic producers who just shit themselves at the idea of going on stage and and playing their music in front of people you know um but they still want to be able to produce music and and uh, you know so for example i've got a friend at the minute who uh does a lot of production for other artists and whatever but he really wants to just produce for himself and and he can't really see an avenue of doing that other than ghost writing which really isn't producing for himself and 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 then you enter a whole new level of stuff where you do ghost production stuff um and i've always sort of said to him well why, why don't you look at doing getting into the sinks and you know library music stuff and whatever and 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 actually i don't know the answer to, to what what's the avenue into that because his response is well how how would i even get about that and and oh. I, like i alluded to earlier on for me personally 80 percent of my career has been accidental where something's happened and and it's just led to another job or whatever and It'd be arguably the same with anyone um yeah i i mean the, the first pick your publishing partner with care i guess understand yeah. the sync credentials you know if you're because probably the best route in from the grassroots up is through a publisher so check their sync yeah. credentials you know did they when did they last sync one you know, how yeah. often a week do they get briefs? How often a week do they pitch? How many sinks yeah. in the last 12 yeah. months? What's the typical value? What genres they normally do? Who are their, who are their clients? You know, Netflix are ours, Adidas are ours, Sky, BT, 
you know, and, and, and multi-genre, and then find out who the sync the, the sync manager is, and strike up a relationship with them. Understand the type of briefs that come in, what the what, what are the reference tracks, as they call them, yeah. born sloppy, as I call it. You know, when I first got my, got into publishing, you, at that point, you would often get around the Olympics. I remember everyone was asking for for born slippy, and born slippy right. carried a particular yeah. price tag, shall we say, and yeah. a complication in in clearing it because the yeah. number of different parties involved and yeah. and because so many were asking Warner Chapel was it I can't remember Warner now I, can't, I, don't think, okay. I don't know I don't think it was it might be moved. but anyway it, well, there was a particular price because it was so in demand so the price kept going up and so what yeah. you would get you could get someone going like I'm trying to get Born Slippy but you know can you get can you get something that sounds like it? You go, yeah, I've got born sloppy, and you go, you know, because it's it's you know, it's the sound like concept. Yeah, Get something yeah. that sounds like it. Yeah. So you find that a lot of publishers working in the sync area will will have a bank of music that has a familiarity to a theme. I'm yeah. not talking about copyright infringement. I'm just literally talking about themes, you know, dynamic yeah, this yeah. or running good for running or you know, yeah. high energy techno or whatever whatever it needs to be. Um, and make a friend of the of the the head of sync or the sync manager and understand the reference tracks understand what's in vogue understand what you could spend your time making but understand whilst you're doing that there's no guarantee of a good result you know that you it's the, it's a very difficult process sync pitching because you won't hear back unless it's successful you yeah, know unlike yeah. demos where you send them in and they go not for you, you, at least you get not from me yeah, you know, or, or, yeah. or promos <laughs> not downloaded for at least at least you can see some kind of dynamic happening yeah. and action yeah. happening with sync it just sort of disappears and then you hear nothing again unless it's yes um and you know we've we've had we've had yeses where where 25 second piece of music as drum and bass actually came off a young lad's hard drive never been released never been finished but it was the perfect match to a mercedes-benz advert it became right. the track for the mercedes-benz advert and yeah. he got the check he walked in and resigned from his job and built a studio because it was it was enough money to do yeah, so yeah, yeah yeah and then at the same time uh, he, you get something out of nothing yeah i've got a uh a, a very good friend uh who um did the music for one of the mcdonald's campaigns uh he'd got the brief and just threw down a couple of demo ideas and threw them out and they came back saying yes we want this one and he went great what do you want from me and they said we like it but can you change whatever one of the lyrics or something and he said fine here you go and sent it off to them and didn't hear anything back for about six months. And I remember asking him, have you heard back yet? Have you heard back? What What's going on? And he goes, no, I've, I've chased it once because I don't want to be pestering too much. And they basically fobbed him off with something that whatever wasn't going ahead. Um, so that was that. And then about six months later, he gets an email from, I, I assume, McDonald's. I don't know, whoever was managing the campaign, uh, saying can you make this little change <laughs> and and he's like oh oh you still want it okay fine and and does the change and great radio silence for six more months this went on for nearly two years until last year so let me think about this actually because i was in my last studio which i moved out of in 2018 2017 it must have been and it was last year during lockdown that an advert came on for mcdonald's and i went is that him and rang him up going did you get that mcdonald's thing he went yeah did you hear it i was like yeah and he, so it took like two two and a half years of one email every six months basically just can you tweak this and then six months later and it can take that long but I, i've not spoken to him about the money but I, i'm gonna hazard a guess that it was uh a fairly tidy sum coming I'd from imagine if it, McDonald's if it was being McDonald's a major saying, campaign. Yeah, yeah he's, it's probably definitely big Mac money. And, yeah. and also remember if it if it ends up on TV, again, depending on whether the rights are bought out or not, you know, you can have trading royalties that can be quite exciting as well. So even if it's mm. just a UK campaign that runs for a month on every TV channel, you know, every commercial TV channel, then you'll, mm. you know, 
there'll be pay per play there as well. And if it's a global campaign, even more. So sometimes the, the trading royalty is more than the fee that's paid up front. You know, and again, yeah, yeah. it comes back to my yeah. point about you know Starlight being something that you're seeing that's in the past. You, you know, a year later, your statement comes through and it's got a nice bumper yeah. surprise in it. So yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. The moral um, of the story is yeah, <laughs> but I think there is a moral of the story, which is you know, in is own it. You know, don't mm. don't not have a manager, don't not have an agent. I'm not I'm not in any way promoting do it yourself because there are yeah. some brilliant um people in this industry who will make brilliant partners to your career and will fit like yeah yeah you know um it will fit together perfectly on yeah. either skill set or knowledge but again it's like anything when people ask me pick the right team do the right things you know and and, and agree what those right things are and get them done yeah, and i think yeah. you can't the, the industry is global. The industry is fast. The industry is cutthroat. Many of those things have always been true. It's just much more obvious now. Yeah, yeah. The margins are thinner. The scale is bigger. The audience is everywhere. So you have yeah. to have a very robust plan to pay attention to everything. And if you don't want to pay attention to everything apart from making music, then you need to understand that you're giving up that responsibility for the industry yeah. of the music industry to someone else. So pick them with great care. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think the thing... If I was to leave a message on the table about anything, it's like if you if you give up ownership and responsibility for something without taking the without due diligence of who you're giving it up to, mm. that is kind of on you because there's enough yeah. people out there to do a bad job as there are to do a great job. So don't you. you know you can't make and assume everybody's going to do a great job. Yeah, yeah. What a way to end this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's been brilliant. It's been really good chat. Yeah, I think we've, you, uh, we've properly put the world to rights now. If only Wait, everyone was as perfect as us. <laughs> I wasn't, and I wasn't even drunk. It's like normally, no, a bit like a bottle yeah. in by now. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank, it's you. Been well, thank you for having me. Do you know what I did? Uh, I did. Uh, <clears throat> assuming this is now off the recording, uh, I did uh, one podcast with. A...